Welcome to our series of Healthcare Scene Interviews, where we sit down with top leaders in healthcare IT. I'm John Lynn, the founder of healthcarescene.com, and I'm happy to host this, this amazing healthcare IT security medical device expert. <laughs> Before we begin, I want to remind those watching live that we'll talk for about 30 to 40 minutes and we'll open up for questions from the audience. Also, uh, just so if you know the Blab interface, if you like what someone's saying or you like that person, <clears throat> You know, you like his bald head or you like my fro hair, you can click on our faces and give us props. Uh, also, on the left side is the tweet and share on Facebook buttons. Feel free to do that and share with your audience. And finally, if you do slash Q for questions, you know, that will add it to the question queue and we'll incorporate it during the thing. Or if not afterwards, we'll, we'll answer those questions. So let's get started uh, with a short intro from our, our medical device security expert, Tony John Domenico from Fortinet. Welcome, Tony. Ah, hey, thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Excellent. Well, uh, Tony, uh, you know, I, sh I should also say that we were supposed to have uh, Amir Lakani here, but uh, I guess he got, got under the weather. So Tony's uh, pinch hitting. Uh, I guess you guys work together. So uh, t tell us about what you do uh, at Fortinet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Omar's a good friend of mine, um, um, so I'm definitely doing him a favor. So, hey, Omar, if you're listening, you owe, you owe me one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a senior security strategist here at Fortinet, and, uh, you know, primary goal is really to understand the tactics, techniques, and procedures of the adversaries to really understand how are they breaking into networks, and then you're making sure that the things that we're doing at Fortinet are aligned, our defensive uh, posture, our technology is aligned with being able to properly defend against those tactics, techniques, and procedures. So and at a very high level, that's basically what um, you know we're doing. That's our mission as a FortiGuard uh, security strategist. Nice. Well, uh, you know, I, I think the reason I reached out to you is, you know, uh, medical security is such a huge issue. I mean, I've, I've spent some time at the uh, various uh, hacker conferences that come through Vegas. Uh, I'm, I'm lucky to be able to go to Black Hats. Hey, and, uh, yeah, you're right there, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, for some reason, they all come through, right? And I leave my cell phone at home, and I I, leave, I don't take any credit cards with me, all of those things. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's such a big topic for medical devices and medical and in the healthcare field. I mean, millions and millions of patient records have been exposed. So I'm excited to have you you here. Um, I, I'd, I, thought, I think I'd start off our discussion just kind of asking the open question, uh, you know, what is the state of cybersecurity from your perspective in the field of healthcare? Well, I mean, I think overall, <laughs> I think the healthcare industry has been a bit slow to adopt some of the latest cybersecurity practices. And I think, you know, a lot of that's really been attributed to the fact that the attacks were kind of focused on different industries, right? I mean, they were focused on retail, they were focused on the financial industry, you know, people were stealing credit cards, they were stealing banking credentials, um, but the tax really weren't focused on the healthcare industry. Now, of of course, we fast forward to 2015 and start of 2016, that bullseye is right on healthcare industry right now. And I think they're playing a bit of a catch up to try to figure out how do I properly defend against those attacks and ultimately actually protect my healthcare data. So I think they're playing a little bit of catch up right now. Hmm. That's interesting you say that. Uh, do you think that, you know, I, I've had some theories about why do we see so many of them today, right? Uh, you know, part of me says, well, we weren't electronic, so there wasn't the data to hack, right? Like, how do you hack paper charts, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that, well, they, they weren't available. But part of me says that maybe we were being hacked and healthcare just didn't know about it. And now we have better systems to actually discover it. Uh, what do you well, think? No, you know, I think it's more, um, <laughs> I always kind of say this, uh, it's awesome that we have an opportunity to leverage technology. Um, the advancements in technology is amazing, right? Um, uh, you know, the thing is, as great as those advancements and those benefits are of that, you know, technology, the more we have to worry about it from a security perspective. So I look at it like, all those medical records are now online, right? Which means now they're more accessible to someone that's not physically um, at or on like a piece of paper or something. You know, it's now it's, uh, you know, in the cloud or it's in the network where you may have the ability to connect to it, um, you know, from somewhere outside of that, you know, physical lo uh, location. Hmm. It's interesting. I, I, you know, I think it goes back to, you know, from my experience going to these security conferences, there's such an overwhelming 
uh, amount of credit card data that's already been breached that now, you know, it's almost a supply and demand black market. Thing, well, right? You know, the bad guys are a victim of their own, you know, success, right? I mean, you look at, uh, you know, the, you know, credit cards, they were, you know, I don't know, five, 10 years ago, they were, you know, a few hundred bucks a credit card. Now they're, you know, a couple bucks, right? So, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, you know, it's all about, you know, supply and demand. Hmm. That's interesting. And maybe you don't know the answer to this question, uh, but I've always wondered because people always like to claim like, oh, you know, healthcare data is worth so much more than a credit card. And, you know, most people put it at the 50 to $100 range, you know, where they come up with that, you know, whatever. You know, my, my question has always been, is there really a demand for that data on the black market? Uh, you know, I've thought about going in there and trying to see, and I was like, wait, do I want the FBI coming towards me? Yeah, like, where's the line, right? Where's the line do I cross or not? Exactly. As a reporter, you know, I'm a tech guy by background, but it's, you know, yeah. well, is there that market for data? Yeah, you know, there is. I think the simple answer is yes. So I think, um, you know, one of the reasons that I think the healthcare sort of data is much more, you know, valuable, I think one, um, you know, we, you know, we talked about, of, you know, of course, uh, the whole supply and demand, you know, it's a, you know, victim of your own, you know, success with so many kind of credit cards being flooded, you know, but also the longevity of that stolen data is much greater from a healthcare perspective, right? I mean, you know, I don't know, John, have you ever had your credit card stolen? <laughs> uh, my wife's has been, mine's not. Yeah, what was that process like? Um, surprisingly decent, but you know, exactly. I went into, yeah. Exactly, that's not, so I've had my credit card stolen a couple times. Uh, the last time was maybe about a year ago. Um, I was contacted within sort of two hours of that, you know, potential fraudulent charge um, I said, yep, that thing's bad. They killed my card. In two days, I was sent a new one and I was up and running like nothing ever happened. So the window of opportunity also that the bad guys have to take advantage of that stolen credit card is now minimized. As in healthcare, though, much longer. You can't re replace your healthcare data. A social security card takes so much longer. So the window of opportunity to capitalize on that stolen data is much greater. Interesting. Yeah, you can't cancel your health record. <laughs> <laughs> it's there, you know. Well, and I think a lot of them use it for financial gains still, but by having the full health record, then you often have more information that lets you sign up for other credit cards yep. which are harder to discover as well. Yeah, not only that. I mean, I mean, healthcare. Um, you know, there a lot of the healthcare data that they're stealing um, is for things like you know identity theft, which then you know you could um, uh, impersonate someone and steal drugs, medical records that then can be sold online on the black market. Um, you know, medical insurance fraud. So there's a lot of things that you can leverage, um, you know, with that technology or that uh, information. Um, I also kind of wanted to mention, sort of alluding to, I think you mentioned it a little bit, you started kind of going down that path, but, you know, there's this thing, um, you know, you know, we didn't talk about it yet, but the, the, the delivery of, of, uh, of, you know, the mechanism for, you know, delivery for malware, the insertion into a network typically is first through a phishing email, right? Mm -hmm. um, you got to make that phishing email believable. Uh, the more information you have uh, about a person, the more believable that email is going to be and the more that you're going to actually click that link and download that malware. So just kind of keep that in mind. They're stealing that information also for other attacks that we kind of talked about before to make those emails look a lot more believable and you're going to click that link. Yeah, that, that's pretty brilliant. Uh, you know, and uh, we can never catch up with the hackers. Uh, you know, let, let's switch gears a little bit to the kind of the medical device side of things. And we've talked about kind of the healthcare IT general breaches that, you know, I think that have taken center stage, but we've seen a number of examples. I mean, I, I remember uh, BlackBerry was on stage, uh, you know, hacking an infusion pump. I, I, saw, I don't know if you saw that video. And, you know, you know, there's just been a number of medical device hacks, uh, you know, what, what's happening with that? And is that a real concern for healthcare? Well, I think I'll start off by saying any device that has an IP address and that's connected to the network or the internet, we all should be fearful that, you know, it's nine times out of 10, there's a possibility that's gonna have a vulnerability and it's gonna be exploited, right? So I think we always have to be worried about all those devices. Now, the medical devices in you know general, you see a lot of um, security researchers focusing on that. I think one, you know, it makes headlines, right? I mean, that's a big deal. Um, <laughs> challenge. 
you know, and I think also, um, you know, the, the, the reality of actually kind of breaking into that medical device and causing harm to a human or something like that. I mean, it's, it's feasible, it's possible, it's, it's very difficult right now. And I think, you know, lucky for us, I think it's actually reserved for Hollywood right now, but, uh, you know, who knows what'll happen in the future. But, uh, you know, you asked the question, um, why is there such a focus on medical devices? Um, you know, it's not just medical devices in general, man. If I put my black hat hat on and I'm trying to break into a network, what I want to do is find as many threat vectors as possible, right? Because that's going to increase my opportunity, you know, to break into the network. And you have these medical devices um, in the healthcare, you know, that industry is kind of unique where all these medical devices are on the network. They're all kind of interconnected. Um, and me as a hacker, when I break into a network, um, uh, you know, wearing uh, my black hat, um, I'm going to land on a machine that um, – I, you know, broke into, it's probably somebody's lab, you know, laptop or workstation. They click the link, but the data that I'm looking for isn't on that workstation. I got to start perusing and moving laterally through the network to find that data. And the way I'm going to do that is by compromising more machines, right? And the more medical devices out there that I might be able to compromise will help me leapfrog through the network and eventually actually complete my cyber mission. Interesting. So it could just be a vulnerability that will get you to other information as well. Exactly. Yep. Hmm. Well, you know, I, yeah, I, I wrote an article yesterday on the smartphonehc.com uh, about the the medical smartphone, which mm. I guess, you know, you might even look at all these medical, uh, the, all these smartphones that doctors and nurses I and mean, everyone's carrying them around the hospital as maybe the biggest medical device security threat, right? Uh, and, 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 you know, I don't think we know how to do, – do we know how to secure a, a smartphone device now? Uh, well, I mean, I think to a certain extent, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of best practices that, you know, you can do. But I think, um, you know, the, there used to be in the past, we used to have that hard shell that sort of, um, you know, showed between the untrusted network and the trusted network. The right. fact that we want information anytime, anywhere um, really uh, blurs – that hard shell, right? So it, it makes it difficult to really actually, pre, you know, protect against, uh, you know, some of these threats out there today. But I mean, there is ways to um, shore those things up a bit. But at the end of the day, I mean, you're still, you know, there's, you're still vulnerable. It's proliferation of threats, right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Holes that you have to fill. <clears throat> That's interesting. I mean, the same thing applies to medical devices. I guess probably one of the big reasons they weren't hacked is they weren't connected to the network. But now we're saying, hey, we want all our medical medical device data to be inserted automatically into the EMR. I want it reporting about how it's doing. I want me to I want to know if its battery's dead so that we can support the infrastructure. So now that it's all connected, maybe that's why you know there's been an increase of. Uh, of interest in okay does this mean that we're going to be hacked on these <laughs> yeah yeah i mean the, you know that and um you know it's all about following the money i mean with you know the bad guys all about making money you know it's all financial gain so i think healthcare now stealing that particular data there's a gain there and now that that industry medical devices obviously is in that industry so there's more of a focus i think on that now hmm. interesting so, I mean, you know, I think one thing that many would look at and say, well, medical devices have to go through this massive FDA clearance process, right? Which, you know, I, I may be understating it, calling it a massive process. <laughs> yeah, a little <laughs> bit. So, you know, I mean, if it's such a massive process to go through FDA clearance, you know, why don't they address these types of issues in that process? And, you know, or, or do they and do, are they doing a decent job? Well, I think um, I always say there's, um, you know, healthcare industry has a, kind of a crystal ball, right? Because the other industries have already gone through this whole, you know, cybersecurity um, progression. And I think right now with the FDA, um, they have guidelines that uh, you know, allow you to, hey, here's, here's what you should follow. Here's some of the best practices. But again, they're guidelines. They're not stringent regulations that you need to follow. Um, you can't all of a sudden just... Um, nail down these, you know, regulations because um, these devices, a lot of them are very com they're complex. Um, they're already in networks. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, one may, a lot of these systems may actually have embedded operating systems in there, which may actually have some vulnerabilities. Um, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, in 
you know, Microsoft or what have you. Um, however, it may take a lot longer for the vendor to be able to, you know, test the stability of the latest patch, which then, you know, obviously they don't want to issue something out that uh, isn't sort of, you know, stable. So that takes a little bit longer. So the complexity there, they're always going to error on the side of, you know, functionality over, you know, security. I think over time, it's going to change, but again, it's going to take some time. Hmm. Well, and you bring up an interesting point, uh, or at least you know what came to my mind when you you know it talks about the approval process for the FDA. I, mean, I still know so many medical devices that are stuck on Windows XP, hmm. and you know, I mean, just by its very nature, the fact that Microsoft is no longer supporting it, one makes it a HIPAA violation in many spheres, uh, you know, which is another topic. Yep. But, you know, if they're not supporting it, they're not updating it, then it's sitting out there as a vulnerability. And I think the reason many do is because the process to get it, it cleared again with a new operating system or new whatever just takes so much time. It's a long time. Yep, it is. Yeah, may, maybe FDA needs to work on some security uh, you know, prioritization. So when there's a security bug, that gets priority over other clearance. I, I don't know. Yeah, well, I, mean, I think that'll happen over time. I think it's just going to be a progression. Um, you know, you're going to see more and more regulations. You know, you're going to see, you know, continued hacks and, you know, so on and so forth. But at the same time, while that progression plays out, I think there's a, you know, the onus really is kind of put on the organization and the security staff to figure out ways to kind of harden or at least minimize that particular vulnerability that, you know, resides in those medical devices in their networks. Well, and that really brings up the next question. I think many people look at it and say, okay, well, I understand why someone wants to hack my EMR for insurance fraud. And, you know, obviously there's lots of financial information, things like that that they can use against, you know, you know, and for profit, right? As you said, uh, profit is the biggest gain that yeah. most people are looking for. Um, but, you know, why would they be motivated to hack a medical device like, like a heart monitor or insulin pump or, you know, other devices like – you know, th th that doesn't seem to store that same information. No, it doesn't store the information, but I would probably go back to what I was talking about before is, you know, a lot of them you know, end up being launching pads uh, for, you know, um, just moving about the network and really finding the valuable data that they're looking for. So I think um, as an, you know, as an attacker, I go back to, you know, being able to identify those additional threat vectors. The more, threat vectors and more vulnerabilities that I can find within the organization, the better off I'm going to be able and the faster I'm going to be able to move throughout the network and actually find the data that I'm looking for and exfiltrate that data out. Hmm. Yeah. And it, I mean, it almost reminds me of what I heard someone say recently about most hackers aren't saying, Oh, I want to hack this hospital and this insulin pump so that I can, you know, kill yeah. Britney Spears or, you know, whatever, right? Like yeah, yeah. it's not that targeted. They're just running script kitties that run across the network and say, where's the vulnerabilities mm -hmm. and medical devices are one of those vulnerable points. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not, so, not so much. I think, like we said before, I think most of that uh, I'm trying to harm someone is still, you know, you know, located in Hollywood. And, you know, we haven't ever, you know, really seen a lot of those real life attacks yet. Yeah. So I guess you're saying that, that maybe if, if you're a hospital CIO or hospital executive, you shouldn't be as worried about, uh, you know, them changing the insulin pump or the heart monitor, but more that it's a vulnerability that then they can access other parts of the network. Yeah. You know, I think it's still a concern, you know, and I think you mentioned, um, it's a good, um, I think you brought up, uh, you know, what should the C-level management, uh, you know, be worrying about? And I think one of the biggest things that the financial industry learned is it's really all about building security programs that's really, you know, based on risk to the business, right? I mean, uh, you know, this this whole cybersecurity market is flooded with so many vendors, so many different technologies, so many different solutions that are supposed to solve all the cybersecurity problems. But at the end of the day, how do you sift through that? Because you only have a certain amount of money, right? I mean, your budget is obviously sort of finite. So how do you figure out um, what are the things that you're supposed to buy? And I think it comes down to identifying the true risk to your business. What's the priority and, you know, addressing those one by one. And I think many, um, you know, many companies don't really do that uh, as well as they probably should. Hmm. Interesting. I, I, you know, along that same line of, of uh, thinking, 
what, what are some best practices when it comes to medical device security that, that you'd offer the C-level executives? Well, I think the first one is probably doing your due diligence from a vendor management perspective, right? Um, you know, identifying all the vendors that uh, are making medical devices that reside within in your network and really talk to them about what are they doing to ensure that the vulnerabilities are, or at least the known vulnerabilities are being taken care of and that they're practicing a um, kind of clean cyber hygiene. Um, that's probably number one. I think number two is, um, the you know medical devices i think is probably going to probably should be treated as critical assets right um and i've always said this before you can't protect and monitor everything right so you have to identify what's critical to the business and focus on monitoring and you know protecting those assets for example leveraging um internal firewalls to segment off those medical devices and also limiting the avenues of approach or what I refer to as the um, limiting the communications the uh, um, that does sort of two things one it it reduces the attack surface so it's um, it's harder to actually break in and I think also provides better visibility when you can reduce those avenues of approach or the or that communication coming in and out and better um, and allows you to better detect when a possible attack may be happening on that you know, particular medical device. And I think the last one is, you know, mitigating controls. Um, you know, I think we've alluded to a little bit earlier on in our conversation where um, there's going to be vulnerabilities that there are, are going to be discovered, but the length of time that you're going to be vulnerable until there is a patch is probably going to be a bit longer than, say, your traditional, um, you know, PC or, you know, laptop or server or what have you. So, um, and that either might, that that may be by you know because of the vendor right because the vendor is saying oh I haven't done the actual retro testing yet um, it's going to be so much longer for me to figure out if how stable the functionality is of this medical device or it could be on you know the organization side as well hey these you know these devices are probably in high demand they're always in production to be able to patch these things I got to take them out of production right which means now they're not going to be used. I have to patch them. I have to do my own testing, make sure they work, and then kind of put them back. So it's going to be a little bit longer. So start thinking about what are the mitigating controls? What do I need to do to add additional uh, per, uh, protection? Or I would say, you know, what I would do is better monitoring capabilities on those particular devices. Um, you know, for example, if it's you know it's vulnerable to, you know, this particular vulnerability and you haven't seen an exploit in the wild, okay, that's great. Well, what are the signs that might sort of tip you off that someone may be trying to exploit that particular vulnerability and hone in on that a little bit more? Interesting. It, it kind of reminds me of what my hacker friend told me. He said, you'll never make something 100% secure, but you can make it hard enough that they don't care about it. Yeah. And they'll move on, right? Because they're all about low-hanging fruit, you know, the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I imagine the advice would be similar to uh, other health IT systems outside of the medical devices as well. You know, uh, evaluating your vendors. Uh, vendors could be one of the biggest risks you have, uh, even if you shore up your internal system. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, you can see. I don't know. I, I don't know how many, but I know there's been quite a few different types of attacks that have really been the insertion point had been from your third, you know, your third party vendors, right? You have all this large organization, you may spend a whole bunch of money fortifying that environment, but then have you really validated all of your third party vendors that may have, you know, direct connections in, you know, into your network? How are you validating that they're meeting the same level of security as you demand within <laughs> your organization? Yeah, you're only as strong as your weakest link. <laughs> yep, you're right. So, you know, I, I think some people look at this and they look at the wave of breaches and, and the number of security vulnerabilities, uh, e even throwing in, well, if Google can be hacked, anyone can be hacked, right? You know, yep. yeah. <laughs> large institutions with the smartest, brightest people in the world can be hacked. You know, how does my little rural hospital in, in Georgia, how does that stand up to it? You know, and so I think many of them take almost like a, oh, well, it's just going to happen approach. Uh, you know, how, how would you respond to someone like that? Yeah, you know, that's a tough one. I mean, I've gotten that a lot. Um, you know, I think that's a much larger problem. Um, you know, everything sort of, everything is connected, right? If you look at um, 
those smaller companies are connected to those larger companies or those mid-sized companies that may have you know, you know, connections to those larger companies, which then has connected to government agencies, right? We're all actually connected. So um, every level has to be, you know, has to be addressed. So the fact that, um, you know, you're saying at that lower level, you may not have that ability. I, I think there's basic things that you could do to shore up your, you know, your environment a bit more, um, you know, granted, uh, you may not have, um, you know, the additional resources, you know, so on and so forth. But that's why there's, there's other, you know, value added resellers. There's, you know, consultants to help them out. I mean, there's, you know, there's things there. And I think, at the same time, though, I, there, I talked about this a little bit. There's a little bit of a movement I think that has to happen. Um, how do you actually solve or actually protect the ecosystem, right? Because if those little guys aren't, um, you know, protecting themselves, because uh, you know, obviously, they're going to get hacked, and then they may be launching pads for the mid-tier and the larger environments to get hacked, it's going to make those larger environments a lot harder to actually hack, which means, you know, some way, shape or form, you know, you're going to have to probably start paying even more for healthcare, you know, you know, to be able to handle the additional level of security that they're going to have to put on. So it's all interconnected. So whatever happens down below is, you know, definitely going to impact, you know, the other layers. Yeah. No, and I think we're becoming more and more interconnected, uh, you know, especially as health systems buy up the hospitals and, and medical practices. So, you yeah. know, in some ways that will help. Uh, although in some ways it becomes so unwieldy, they don't even realize what's happening within the health system. <laughs> it's hard. It's, it's a hard problem. I mean, we still have the problem. I mean, look how the, uh, the other industries, um, you know, they've definitely shored up their security practices and there's a mo much more stringent, you know, regulations. Uh, but I mean, they're, they still continue to be breached. Yeah, well, and, you know, I think the other thing we need to do, uh, you know, which this is a little off topic, but, you know, kind of related to what we're talking about is, you know, we've almost created this culture of like, you're awful if you have a breach. And we have mm. many of these organizations come back and they report that, hey, I found a breach in our system and I'm reporting it because HIPAA requires it, right? We have the HHS Hall of Shame or, you know, Wall of Shame where yeah, the, the yeah. breach will happen, right? Uh, but, you know, we shouldn't condemn those people. I mean, because if they were able to find it, that means they probably implemented good security practices and oh, they yeah. realized there was a breach, you know? Oh. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it's that saying that we always say it's not a matter of if, but when, I mean, I, I give, um, I give props to folks that are able to, you know, quickly find when there is a breach in their network. And that's, that's probably the other advice from a general, pr you know, perspective, um, you know, protect what you know, you know, but then understand that there's going to be times that there's going to be a breach. Mm -hmm. Shore up your monitoring and detection capabilities, you know, to be able to quickly identify when there is a breach and also understanding the, the scope of the breach. Is it just one machine? Is it five machines? Is it 50 machines? And then what are your business processes or, or your incident response processes to be able to, you know, you know, quickly go in there, isolate the breach, contain it, you know, recover from that breach and get your, you know, business processes back up and running again. No, it's a, it, it's certainly a challenge, but uh, it's going to be so important though, because when you see the damage, what happens when a breach happens, you know, the, the ones I've seen that have been most uh, successful when a breach happens is the ones that have made a, a reasonable effort. And then the damage isn't nearly as bad uh, because they can sh point to the reasonable effort that they, they've made. It's sure. the, the belligerence, the the naivety that you know I think most people can't stand when it's something so apparent that yeah. you know th that comes back to haunt them. Yeah, you know, it, it goes back to me. Uh, you just have to show that you cared, right? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Showing a little bit of due diligence, you did what you needed to do to, you know, secure your network as much as possible. But you know, knowing that, you know, they're probably going to get in. Yeah. Um, that's that's what you need that to do. Yeah. So, uh, Geo Mika in the chat room asked the question: Do medical devices need full encryption? And you know, I mean, I think that's interesting. You know, in the HIPAA world, if it's encrypted, you know, it's kind of a get out of jail free card, right? It's encrypted. <laughs> I don't have to report it, right? Like, is the same yeah. for medical devices? What do we see happening there? Well, I mean, it really depends. I mean, I think encryption really has to do with, um, you know, the 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 classification of the data, right? I mean, is there is there you know specific 
um, sensitive, you know, data that's going to reside in those medical devices. If there is, then then maybe there's some, you know, there's some, you know, validity to that. Um, if there's not, I think the focus would be probably more around um, stronger authentication mechanisms in there. Uh, that would probably help a little bit more. But um, you know, the 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 full. Uh, you know the full uh, you know the full encryption i think is really are you know centered around data so so the question would be is there sensitive data that needs to be encrypted um if so then yeah you know it kind of makes sense but if there's not then i don't know right. probably not well and it goes back and you know phoenix tears the 321 said you know sadly sometimes the breach happens from people and not machines and you know so if someone breaches the person and you have the keys encryption doesn't matter right <laughs> right yeah yeah, that, yeah that's true too yeah Excellent. So any uh, final words of advice before we wrap up this segment and open up to the audience for uh, questions? No, I mean, I would just think, um, I think, uh, you know, one of the things, and not just for healthcare, but for all organizations, um, what I like to preach is um, you, you, you really need to understand uh, the adversaries or the bad guys out there. Um, who, you know, who are they at a high level and how are, how are they breaking into the networks? And, you know, you know, one of the reasons or the ways that you find out that, I mean, it's, it's external threat intelligence, but I think before you learn about that, you learn more about yourself, your internal threat intelligence. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What's the data that resides within your network that's valuable to your business and where is it, right? Because once you understand the data, you can identify who are the bad guys that are motivated to actually steal that particular data, right? And then you can start matching up, um, you know, following what we refer to as the kill chain and see how your defensive postures line up with the way the adversaries are trying to break into the networks and steal your data. Beautiful. Great advice. Well, I'm, I'm really grateful to have you here with me. Uh, you know, this has been a nice uh, chat about medical device security. Uh, you know, you see the potential for, for so much damage, but also, you know, I think if there's, there's some hope. If you just take some efforts, I, I think you can thwart the biggest challenges. I have to agree. So thanks so much, everyone that's watching uh, on the recorded version. You can check out more videos at healthcarescene.com. We'll also put up the Q&A as a separate video on the Healthcare Scene uh, channel on YouTube. So check that out and uh, check out healthcarescene.com. A big thank you uh, to Tony John Domenico from Fortinet.